remember Jonathan to other Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Sebastian, change your name. Uh, oh, yes, I don't want to be there. Yeah. And is it a uh, curious question? Is people similar to last time they were on or different, different groups? Yeah, they're coming into the room right now. If you look down below, you see participants, click on that. You'll see a list of uh, attendees. It's up to 30 right now. Uh, going to be some, probably some the same, some different. It's a, the crowd's changing here and there, but there's a lot of the same people that watch every day. Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome to the call, by the way. Uh, we're getting ready right now and waiting for everybody to come in the room. So do you, uh, do you see it down there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. And they'll be coming in for the next 10, 15 minutes, more and more people. Uh, filling up the room. That's the way it typically works. Um, I'll get my other screen set. You're welcome, Christian. Love doing them. I uh, love helping you guys out out there. The, the media and everybody loves to make it look like a bleak world, but it's actually not. Um, for you guys know, if, if you, uh, like I told, I told people before in other calls, there's a guy named Justin. And he has a YouTube channel called Just space in health space health so just in health and uh he, he gives the actual coronavirus numbers without all the hysteria math as he calls it and not all the uh the inflation and the uh drama it's actually not that bad we make it seem like the whole world's falling apart but uh the bell curve we're getting to the top of the bell curve we're almost there um he factors it based on deaths and not based on um reported cases and the reason for that is because reported cases will be going up because of the fact that the, they're testing more and more and they're allowing doctors to decide somebody has uh, the coronavirus for, you know, based on like when they, there's a bunch of weird tr uh, criteria where doctors get to decide if somebody had the coronavirus or didn't, sometimes based on their opinion. Plus there's um, some people that are dying of the coronavirus is getting manipulated too, because somebody could have the cor coronavirus be asymptomatic, which like 86% of people are. Minimum of 86% of people are, are not even bothered by it and fall off his roof and die. And the doctor will say, oh, he had coronavirus and died, even though he had, he had, the death had nothing to do with that. So the numbers are all inflated. They call it hysteria math. It's not yeah. actual math. So Is that kind of sad math. though? Like, Yeah, super sad. It's because it manipulates the public and we're all running around in fear. I see it when I walk around on the streets, how terrible. Oh well, think about how much that like we'll be talking about eventually, which that's the thing you could bring up, the topic that we can talk about, like the market. Mm -hmm. And that hysteria all affects the market, exactly mm -hmm. what you're going to talk about today. It gets in there, it screws with the market a lot. So, um, so check it out, guys. Um, I actually might want to try to get him on an interview so you guys can understand where he comes from. Okay, um, let's talk about it. Christian wrote, I, I suffered so much with the market, stock market. The, the market's just down right now, dude. If you haven't taken your money out, you haven't suffered anything. It, it, I'm sure it'll come back up. That's the, that's, if you look at life, everything goes up and down cycles, even seasons, even the year, even natural law. Um, people said that about Bitcoin. I lost so much in Bitcoin. I'm like, I just didn't take it out. And then it went back up, you know? Um, and so unless you take, you know, it, it, so I'm going to let Jonathan talk about that. That's well, his expertise. I saw Christian said you keep buying Zoom stock. Christian, you bought the right Zoom stock though, right? I hope so. <laughs> did you, did you guys like Brian, you hear about that? Uh -uh. I, I was talking to Dave about this and it was really funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Christian knows what I'm talking about. So there is, there is zoom, um, communications, which is, uh, the ticker symbol is Z O O M. And then there is zoom technologies, which is something separate. So when this all started and people were talking about, there was a lot of spike in zoom traffic for like what we're on right now. People just took to the markets to try and start buying Zoom stock because they said Zoom's seeing a lot of uptick in people using it. People started buying though the wrong Zoom, and this company was a penny stock. They were trading under five dollars a share, and in a day they went from like four, like let's say four fifty or so, I think, to twenty one dollars a share. Yeah. It was absolutely insane. And then when people finally realized what was going on, they started Dang. selling out of it and the SEC actually had a halt trading on that company because it was going down so quick that if they would have continued doing it, the company would have just completely gone under. So they literally mm -hmm. had a freeze trading on it so people couldn't get out. Um, or Surprised the FCC cares since it was a penny stock, but whatever. That's cool. <laughs> I'm surprised the F FCC cared since it was a penny stock. But. Well, um, they, they cared because it was 
unfortunate, they'll call it manipulation. So it was the wrong mm -hmm. stock people were trading. And because it jumped above $5 a share, they're going to spend a lot more time looking at it. And I mean, it, they probably would have ignored it if it wasn't on the news, but it, even like CNBC was reporting it. So they were probably like, shit, we gotta, we gotta step in and, <laughs> and stop this. Nice. <laughs> could you imagine being like the CEO of the company for, for oh, Zoom, yeah. uh, Zooming, whatever the heck they are, I forget their true name, but for one day, all of a sudden your company goes up like, and you have no idea why you're like, sitting yeah, there. you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and then there's that whole part. Like, should I sell? Should I sell quick? Cause now I figured out what's going on. <laughs> But that would be illegal, wouldn't it, if I sold right now? Yeah. Um, okay, guys, this is Jonathan Turner. Um, he is a second-generation wealth advisor. He grew up in the business, so he is not some guy that just got his certificate and then went out and decided to start a business. He's actually successful. He actually makes people money. He actually manages my money, Dave's money, a lot of people we know's money. Uh, he's actually speaking for us and with us uh, at various events and doing a great job. Uh, he really knows how to handle money, and he has a – Huge love for sports cars. What you own a, um, um, a Cobra, a Shelby Cobra replica, and a um, McLaren. Yep. And is this, is this one purple or orange? You had an orange one. Now you have a purple one. Still got the orange one, but purple one's the newest baby. That's the, the newest. Baby. Oh, I thought you sold one. Okay, so you got oh, two. No, no. God, no, I, they're like they're my children because I don't have children yet. So right mm -hmm. now I have children that have four wheels. <laughs> so yes, uh, yeah. So his cars are his children and your dog, and uh, he loves cars. Doesn't give a hoot about who cares whether he likes cars or not it's not to impress people he just loves cars we talk about this mm -hmm. a lot he wants to have a whole collection of cars he thinks they're amazing mm -hmm. um and he's, he talks about how you spit and and i think this is really important the reason i'm bringing this up is because he talks about as an how they're such a horrible investment and how if you really want to make money you don't invest in cars but if you're going to do it this is how you do it right so um i'm going to let jonathan take over you're frozen jonathan are you there i'm not i'm not frozen your screen's frozen on my screen. On my screen, your face is frozen. I don't know what that's about, but that's awkward. Yeah, it looks normal. On mine. Is anybody else having that problem? I hope not. Yeah, I see him frozen too. Okay, so you, there may be something going on with your Wi-Fi. Well, if it, let's, let's see, your voice is good. So if we have a problem with your voice, maybe we'll freeze you at some point, or we'll have to have you log out and log back in. But we can hear you, and we got a nice picture of you. That's okay. It's not, it's not like you're <laughs> yeah. in weird. You're yeah. back. That's a, if hey, come back. Just let me know, and I can I can always jump off or something. No, you're good now. You're all back. So, okay. let's have Jonathan Turner take over and uh, teach you guys a little bit about money and um, how to invest, how to keep keep how to build into a giant nest egg, and how to deal with this whole Corona and look at this whole coronavirus situation around the economy, money, and so forth. So, take it away, Jonathan. I'll jump in here and there, and I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to steer you a little bit in some directions, maybe oh. or things like that. But uh, for the most part, I'll, I'll see what you got, what you want to say first, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Works for me. Well, hey, guys. I mean, first off, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for attending this. This is awesome. So um, I'll try to keep this as lighthearted and fun as I possibly can. If you do have questions, though, about anything I'm talking about, by all means, type them up. I'm going to be from time to time, if you see my eyes going away off the center screens, because I'm looking at the screen as far as any questions. So definitely want to answer as many questions as I possibly can for you. But um, let's start from the very top, I guess, first uh, with where the world is at right now. So we are going through arguably one of the greatest black swan events in the history of not only our economy, but probably in the history of the world with what's happening with the coronavirus. And I think it's really neat, though, that you know, with Fearless starting uh, these, these talks and doing these videos, it really plays in very well with me being on board today to talk to you about money because emotions and money go hand in hand. And human beings, being a human means that you're an emotional creature. You have emotions, which also means that you're an irrational creature. And from time to time, we act extremely, extremely irrational. And one of the biggest things that people act irrational around is money. There is so much emotion that's created around the thought and the concept and the usage of money. And a lot of times it's because money is being looked at in the wrong aspect, in the wrong light, and it's being put to use in the wrong way. And I'm sure we've all seen it um, with people that flaunt money in certain ways to show off material things, to try to elevate their status. Other people uh, go off and do great things with their money. So money itself, the first thing I always like to talk about is what is money? What's the purpose of money? 
money itself is nothing more than a tool. And that's the one thing I want to always hammer away to everyone. And if you take away just one thing from today is that money is a tool. And like any tool, if you don't use the tool right, it's going to, something's going to break. So if you're going to build a house, you're using your hammer. If you're not going to take that hammer and hit the nails the right way, the house is probably going to eventually going to fall down. Same thing with the money. If you're not using money as a tool and using it the right way, eventually your house will collapse. And that will then create, of course, guess what? Emotions, it can cause you to do very stupid things in periods of high emotions, which right now, for example, while you're seeing everything with the coronavirus happening, it's why people are freaking out so much. And it's why the markets are selling off just so irrationally. People are freaking out because they think that this is the end of times and that their money is never going to come back. And what is really nothing more than a loss on a computer screen or a few digits on a, uh, an account online, people are taking it as gospel. It's causing them to then sell when they shouldn't sell. And of course, what that does then, you're locking in that to become a real loss. And that's creating even further emotions and causing the market to go down even more. It's one of the things I hate right now in our society is how much the news interplays with things and causes people to have these emotions. And guess what? The news isn't going away, but as the news keeps reporting about the virus, notice how right now there's nothing being talked about about the lives that are saved. There's nothing being talked about, about how certain industries are thriving uh, because of what's happening. All we hear about is this fear mongering and it's because fear sells. And bad news sells a lot better than good news. The bad news, though, precipitates to having larger emotions and people then doing things that they shouldn't do, which all goes back to money. People are either spending money irrationally right now or people investing or divesting their money irrationally. Uh, I mean, I wish I could be in front of you to say who, how many people have seen the people that have gone to Walmart or Costco or Target and not only the toilet paper, because the toilet paper that in and of itself is the dumbest thing. But how about all the people that are buying up food and the majority of it, I'm not, I'm not sure where you shop at, but at least the places that I've gone to in both Pennsylvania and down in Florida right now, when we've gone shopping, I'm getting stuff from the frozen food section or something that's not perishable. And guess what's all missing off the shelves? All the perishable shit is all gone because people are just running and trying to take all the chicken and bread that they possibly can. It just it makes no sense. <laughs> but at the end of the day though, what you're seeing is a big shift as far as how money is gonna move in this country. And going forward, hopefully it makes people understand that they need to start paying a lot closer attention to their investments and to how they actually do things. Because the market itself is down right now, year to date, around 25%, depending upon which index you're looking at. And if you were invested in just that index, you're along for the same ride. So with that, you've gone down the exact same amount. And I see, oh, am I still frozen entirely? Okay, yeah. so you can hear. Okay, so you can hear me at least. I don't know what's going on. So I see a lot of people saying I'm still frozen. I apologize. Your face is frozen. Your voice has been fine. So, okay. So don't don't try not. Yeah, read that stuff as much as you can, or it messes up your head when you're talking. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I just want to make sure that people can actually hear me. Okay, perfect. So. Um, your, your audio is good, man. You're good to go. Okay. Then I won't even worry about it. So what I was getting at is with investing and with the indexes right now, for example, where people have uh, the markets down 25%, if you're investing in the basic index, you've taken it on the chin the same level as the index. Now, as the index and the markets do eventually rebound, you'll be able to, of course, earn that money back. However, most people aren't doing that. A lot of people right now, um, and me and Dave have talked to this, me and Brian, um, and quite a few others that, that are on here, we've had personal calls talking about what to do in these periods of emotions and also what not to do. But many people that aren't using an advisor or, or just looking at the news are, are doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. That's causing, again, this market to be a lot deeper than where it really should be. And it's also gonna cause it to go on a lot longer until you see things recover. And unfortunately it's sad, but that's the way that we, uh, the way the world is right now. A um, Couple of things I wanna get into today then about the markets is number one, how you wanna start using money as that tool. So that's the framework that I wanna focus on first and foremost. The second is uh, we can talk about, I saw a few comments also asking about using cars as an investment, which 
I can very briefly touch base on that. And then also we want to have as many questions as possible to answer. Um, so any questions you guys got, let me know. All right, so using money as a tool and to your advantage. So like I said at the very onset of this video, if you don't use the tool the right way, it won't work for you. So the first framework, the first part of this, you always need to figure out is what is the amount that you have of that available tool right now? And what can you do with it? Now, investing does not mean always just the stock market. There are literally thousands of things you can do besides just the stock market. But before you should ever consider investing, before you do anything, you need to start to figure out what are your goals in life? What do you want to do with your actual life? And where do you want to see yourself, not only in the next five years, but all the way at the end of your life? And you always want to start with the end in mind in anything that you do. And then you start to work backwards. If you, anything that you do, if you start by thinking about where is the end going to be, what's your exit strategy, what's your end goal, you'll be able to then start to quantify what you need to do to fill in the gaps so that you can start to achieve all of the goals that you ever want in life. I've done it for myself. I've done it for Dave and Brian and many other people. And it's no secret. Uh, there's nothing that's special about what I'm doing. There's no black magic or anything else. All that I'm doing is helping people to visualize where they want to get to. And then I'm holding them accountable. So the one thing to tell you is it's like going to the gym. And that's why I jokingly call myself a financial fitness coach. So if you look at every single bodybuilder in history, or any sports player, any athlete, whatever it may be, they all have a coach. No one's ever really done it on their own. And it's not because they didn't have talents or anything else. It's the coach is there to solve one problem that everyone has, and that's called accountability. No matter who you are, you will always have a moment of weakness, and that's part of life. That's just being human. Having the coach there is what's going to help to hold your foot to the fire. And the first step I would always say when you're trying to do something, especially when it's with money, is have a coach. Now, I'm not saying that just so you want to work with me because there's plenty of coaches out there. Find some of those you trust and find someone that's going to hold you accountable because no app, no website, no form of technology is going to ever hold you accountable like a human being. And that, at the end of the day, is the biggest thing that I provide. And I always tell everyone, I'm not here to make anyone a millionaire. I'm not here to grow your wealth immensely or do anything for you that is unreasonable. I'm here to help you figure out what wealth is and help you to achieve it. I'm not going to do really any work as far as building your wealth other than helping to determine and craft the investments. But along the way, it's going to take you, the person actually contributing consistently week after week, after week, after year, after year, putting money into the investments to continue to grow them. Because the one thing that people always get caught up on is investing money and rate of return. And right now, it's not a big topic, but if just a year ago, the stock market was up 22%, and everyone thought that they were a market wizard. Now, also, everyone thought that 22% was attainable all the time, and now you're seeing it's not, unfortunately. But with that, if you have just $1,000 and you invest it, and you Assume you're going to get a 22% rate of return every single year. What's 22% of a thousand bucks? It's not a lot at all. <laughs> so you're going to have 220 bucks at the end of the year. That's not going to build your wealth. You have to consistently day in and day out continually add to that. So that's why figuring out the end first allows you to figure out what you need to do. And when I say the end, I mean the end of your life. Where do you want to get to? Where do you want to live? What kind of house do you want to have? What kind of cars? Uh, what do you want, where do you want to travel? Are you going to have children? Are you going to be just single? All of that. And that stuff is very important to think about right away. And the reason it's so important is you can then start to figure out what the cost of all that stuff would be. And once you think of all that, and I've done it for myself, but it's the same thing, like I said, with Dave and Brian. And for myself, as an example, I know exactly where I want to live uh, once I retire. I know the kind of cars that I want to have. I know the exact cars I actually want. I know the prices of them. And I could then craft and figure out well, what is it all going to cost me? So I know in 20 years and 30 years and 40 years and 50 years and 60 years, even God willing, I know what the cost of my life will be. Now I have to just figure out along the way, what do I have to put away to get there? So I can look at Jonathan Turner right now, who is 33 years old. He wants to have a house in Naples, Florida on the water 
uh, by the time he's 60. And that house is where he wants to retire. I know the square footage of the house. I know what it would cost to build that house today. And I also know the vehicles I want to have at that house. Well, I could take all of that then to say, here's the dollar figure that I need, not only to purchase and acquire those, but also to purchase that house. But here's the lifestyle that would be associated with that house, meaning here's how much would be the upkeep on the house. Here is the kind of lifestyle I want to be able to go out to dinner, to be able to travel with my wife and possibly my family at that point in time. I know all of those numbers already. So I can now figure out what do I need to not only earn in my life right now, what do I have to bring into my household between me and my wife, but also how much do I actually have to save and invest and deploy elsewhere? And I saving money, I hate the word saving because if you're putting money in the bank, first off, you're getting ripped off. Banks are not there to be your friend. Banks are there to make money for themselves. Instead, you want to take the money and invest it. You want to deploy it into other ways that will not only grow, but they'll become a paycheck for you in the future. And if you, along the way, the right amount that you can invest and also keep very, very reasonable goals and expectations for those numbers as far as rates of return, you'll be able to hit those goals pretty damn well. And it's like with anything though, if you can quantify it, you can track it. And the bodybuilding analogy works so well when I say this, because if I want to be a bodybuilder and step on stage at a bodybuilding show, be 3% body mass, have 25 inch biceps and a 26 inch waist, it's going to take number one, many, many years to get to the size that I have to build up to before I can lean down and actually step on stage. But number two, it's going to take consistency. I have to eat the right foods day in and day out. I have to do the right amount of cardio. I have to do the right lifting and not only the right lifting, I have to do the proper form of lifting. And then along the way, I have to make sure I don't have cheat meals or anything else. And I have a coach that is there to guide me along this way. And it's because the coach has done it before. They've lived it. And I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the saying, but they say, learn from your mistakes. Uh, I, I hate that saying because learn from other people's mistakes. Don't do the same things that other people have already done and it's not gonna work. You wanna have someone that's gonna help guide you so you can avoid those mistakes that someone else might have taken. For example, with myself, um, being a car fanatic, I came into my career, I started to do very well for myself and I started to purchase a vehicle, but I was buying a car just from my income. So I was not investing money towards my future, even though I knew what I had to put aside. I was wasting money. I was pissing it down the toilet because I wanted to have a cool car and look cool and everything and fulfill my need for the vehicle, but it didn't do anything as far as paying me. It did nothing. So I had to have a come to Jesus moment with myself, uh, actually on the night of my third birthday to figure out where do I want to get in life, but also what do I need to do to be able to attain that? And I had to do the exact vision for myself. I had to actually sit down and think and quantify like everything I want to do. And then along the way would afford me the ability to start having fun with vehicles because no longer would I use my income to just buy the vehicles. I would use investment income to purchase vehicles. So I can have money now that if I direct and I invest, as long as it's maintaining a rate of return better than what I might pay on interest for any loans, that money is essentially free at the end of the day. And that's a strategy that I've employed for myself now going forward for the past couple of years and will continue to do. So when I purchase vehicles, for example, right now, the vehicles themselves, I'm really no longer just buying a car. And with the McLaren, for example, buying that car, I had to put a certain amount of money down. Instead of just putting money down and using cash, I was able to use my credit card. Um, I called them and had to tell them I want to raise the limit for one day. And they kind of looked at me a little crazy, but, um, I used a credit card to put the down payment on the McLaren. And the reason I did that, instead of just writing a check, I was able to get a lot of points off of the credit card. Now I had the money in cash for the down payment and the very next day I did pay off the credit card so I didn't incur any interest. But I did accumulate a ton of points that I could then use to do other stuff with. Part of it was um, our honeymoon, pretty much all of our air travel was taken care of because of the down payment on the vehicle. Now the amount that I financed I was able to get a interest rate from the bank. That was a very, very attractive rate for a five year period of time. So I have a 3.9% interest rate on the remaining balance of the loan for the vehicle. As long as I maintain a rate of return above 3.9%, every payment that's coming out is now, guess what? It's essentially gonna be free because at the end of the day, my brokerage account, which 
I could have written a check to buy the vehicle, but again, I'd be wasting that because the car's not going to go up. It's going to go down. Instead, I now have to write a check every month from the investment side. The check comes out, investments are sitting there doing their job. So even when you do have periods like what's happening right now, my investment account is obviously down a little bit as well, just like everyone else is across the road. I'm no wizard where my account's going to just magically grow, but it's down right now. But guess what? As I've invested over the past couple of years, it's done this. And so for right now, I know that as long as I maintain the strategy, I don't just run for the hills and pull all my money out, it will come back. But also I know that I have enough that if it never came back, God forbid, I still have enough to afford the actual vehicle. And that's the one thing that's never really taught at all um, about money. It's how to use it the right way and use debt really the right way also. A lot of people look at credit cards as just free money. Let's go out and spend, 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 spend. And all of a sudden now it's the end of the month and I've got this huge bill that doesn't just go away and it continues to rack up month after month after month because of the interest. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of people fall into that trap in this country. And the same also goes with real estate, but also vehicles. I mean, people sometimes purchase a home that they really shouldn't buy just to have the house. And there's a saying, it's called your, your house rich and money poor because you bought a house that's too big for really what your need should be. Um, one thing I, I always tell people and I like to educate people on is how to figure out what kind of house you should have and also figure out where uh, your money should be and how to invest it. And so it's a very simple calculator that you can do and anyone can do this and I'll share it with you right now. If you think of a house, whatever it is that you want, you gotta think of what's the price of the house gonna be that you ideally want. So for, the example right now, if you were to have on your calculator and you took a million dollars, say you want to have a million dollar house, right? We're, we're aiming for the stars. Your dream house is going to be a million dollars. If you have a million dollar house, multiply it by 0.3. So do multiplication 0.3. That stands for 30%. That's $300,000. So if you want to buy a million dollar house, the absolute minimum annual income that you should have coming into your household should be $300,000. That's the absolute bare minimum. Now, if you want to figure out how much you need to have saved up by the time you get to retirement, you want to take that $300,000 and then you divide it by 0 0.04. So divide 0 0.04 in your calculator and you should get $7.5 million. That's how much money you would need to afford not only the house, but also the lifestyle throughout perpetuity, meaning to the end of your life. And that's right there. One thing that many people don't ever teach or talk about is how to afford the house and how to afford a certain lifestyle. And lifestyle could be anything. It could be being able to travel the road. It could be having cool cars or whatever else. For me, I just am a car connect. So I want to race cars and have as many as I possibly can. It could be as simple though, as having your family and just being able to provide food on the table. There, there is no right or wrong answer here. And unfortunately, again, society loves to only look at the materialistic stuff and that's it. But if you do this calculation, you could figure out very easily what kind of house and what kind of dollar figure you start to save up. And now you can, if you're say 30 years old and you're gonna retire at 60, well, you're gonna figure out how over the next 30 years you're gonna get seven and a half million dollars. Now it becomes pretty real and also attainable. Can I jump in real quick? Cause I think you're really yeah. Solid there. Um, when you guys, I want you guys to all think about this. If you can figure out what you want to retire at or what kind of money or what kind of house you want to have, maybe not even retirement, maybe it's 10 years from now or five years from now. What is that big goal that he's talking about? And you want to get it. Maybe you want to have this house in five years or 10 years. And it may seem ridiculous. It may seem like it's shooting for the moon for you, but get that down and get those numbers down. He's talking about but then then when we coach you, like, for example, we're coming out with money programs, mindset, money programs um, around around uh, changing your reality with financials and things like that. When we coach you, you have a concrete, exciting goal that you are physically turned on for to start going for. And as we start to coach you in, whether it's starting a business, because that's one of the best ways to make money to invest is get your own business going and it sets you up independence or, or whatever. And it may seem utterly impossible to hit that number based on your current situation. But if you set the goal your subconscious, your reticular activating system gets a hold of it, it knows how to get you there. It processes it millions, if not billions of bits of data per second, depending on who you're talking to. It knows a ton of ways to get you there. Not one, a ton. 
you can't see it consciously. And as we, if you look at my older videos, we talk about shifting your reality so that you can see those ways. And that's the breakdown to breakthroughs or the breakthroughs to breakthroughs and, and all the releasing. And we'll teach you how to start shifting your reality up so that you can see, have the consciousness to see how and to, to not only see how, but to achieve these goals. So get these numbers down, figure this out so that we have a path. You have a path to go through. Whether you take these courses online or you take them from somebody else, that's the first step. Have something exciting that you want to go for. It's the same thing as doing a job that you're excited about too. Be turned on for your job, be turned on for your goals. Therefore, you're turned on for your life and it make, and the, the subconscious mind makes it 10 times easier to go get that stuff and make it happen. So that's why I want, yeah. I want to illustrate the importance of what Jonathan's saying here. And I, and yeah, you hit on the head there too. And I, and I can't stress enough about how specific you want to be with your goals and your everything you want to do in life. And in, again, be specific with everything. It doesn't have to be just the material things. It could be the job that you want and exactly how you want your office to be set up at that job, where you want it to be and everything else. Um, I mean, for me, for the very first car that I wanted an exotic car, I knew even 10 years ago, what color I wanted for that car. I knew the car I wanted. And when I finally got to that point, okay, I got that exact car. And it's not because of just happenstance. I had a goal and I was focused on it. I was very crystal clear. Here's the car I want. Here's how I'm going to afford this car and structure everything. And here's how it's going to happen. And then when it happened, great, on to the next. Same with the career that I'm in, doing financial advice, but also I have a, my more prominent career now is being in charge of a hedge fund. And for years, I talked about helping to create a hedge fund, running the hedge fund and how it would all happen. And it didn't just fall into my lap. It was a lot of very, very small steps that added up to one large result, but also didn't happen overnight. And it was upon a vision that I had for many, many years. It's consistency. And it's also quantifying it. I had a goal, whatever it was, and I could track it. And if you can quantify, you can track it. And uh, one of the questions, Barino uh, looks like he had typed up something. And he was asking about uh, with the age of social media and making money online. Your very last thing you said, though, on that question, it says, I'm worried because there's a lot of gurus that teach about finance. Uh, or is it all about action and consistency? You answered your own question. First off, and Brian, Dave, and everyone else that's ever heard me talk before knows how much I absolutely fucking hate gurus. <laughs> they are all full of shit. There is no person that has achieved wealth overnight. The only way they've done it is because they create a course on how to achieve wealth overnight and people are dumb enough to pay them for it. That's it. That's the only way. And most times you see people that create these entrepreneurial classes and everything else, they've never done it, especially if they're young. I'll tell you this. If they don't have probably gray hair, they don't have a lot of experience and things like that. If you cannot build a large business overnight, uh, with the very, very, very few rare exceptions like Facebook and things like that. But you don't see also Mark Zuckerberg out there then advertising how to do what he did. No, he's making his money and he's enjoying life. He's not there trying to sell you a course. So at the end of the day, action and consistency, those are the things. And also I'll add one more, accountability. Those are the things that can get you whatever you want in life, no matter what it is. Vehicles, well. I want to ask you well, a question about the comment on that too, because it's really important what you're saying. Um, most people are trying to sell you. I was watching a guy last night. Here, give me ten thousand dollars, and I'll build you an Amazon business that makes X amount of money, and <laughs> and, and it's gonna you're gonna be making money overnight. You don't have to do anything. Just give me ten thousand dollars. And why do we need your ten thousand dollars? Because Amazon only lets us have so many accounts. So we need your money, and you're gonna make. Mm -hmm. You know, it just sounds too good to be true. It is, and when you. When you think about this stuff, what I what I want to say is what we what we work on is your mindset, and your mindset and your ability to understand how to grow. That doesn't mean you don't have to grow. You're gonna have to grow. You're gonna go through your stories, your beliefs, your pain, and you're gonna build something real that takes a little bit of time, but real. But once you get it, you'll be able to recreate stuff like that over and over and over again. If you took Mark Zuckerberg's business away, he'd create something else overnight because it's inside of him now how to do that, right? And so what I want to ask you about is for all these people out there that don't tune into these calls with somebody like Jonathan because they, they're scared. Like you say, I can have whatever you say, I can, I can get that car, but look at my life. It sucks. How am I supposed to get that car? Or that you say like map out my dream home and I map it out. And I'm like, there's no way to that dream home. There's no way to ever make that happen. 
Like, like with my life, it is, and and I don't see any any path that's going to make me enough money to be able to buy that. Um, what would you say to those people? Because I I say you know you're only limited by what you, if you can't see a path, it's only because you're not conscious enough. It has nothing to do with what's actually true. But what do, what do, would you say? I agree 100. percent And me and you have worked on this at length uh, with my own personal struggles on that alone. Um, but mindset is everything, and if you have a broke mindset, uh, meaning if you were in doubt on no matter what it is, ah, I'm never going to be able to talk to that girl. I'll never be able to date that girl or I'll never have that car. Or, I'll never have that light or anything else. Guess what? You're never going to freaking have, it. it's not going to happen. Whereas if you have that positive mindset, the rich mindset, whatever you want to call it, the wealthy mindset, I'm going to, I'm going to have that girl. I'm going to marry that girl. One day. I will have that car. I will have that house or I'll attain that lifestyle that I want. I will do this. You're reinforcing it to yourself and your brain and subconsciously your brain will start to eventually help provide that to you. It'll provide the answers. It's not going to magically be like a switch that says, Oh, great. Here you go, Jonathan. You kept saying you're going to do this. And now I'm just going to reward you. No, you got to go out and do it. But your brain is helping reinforce it to you. That's going to get you out of bed every single day then and keep you going to say, I'm not going to stop until I get that. It becomes a burning desire then. Just like, guess what? When you see people that may be less fortunate and they say, I'm never, I'm never going to have that. What's their brain telling them? You're never going to have this. And it's doing everything it can subconsciously to say, you shouldn't do this. Oh, that might be a benefit. And you're so afraid of benefiting that, no, you don't want to take this opportunity because you're scared. Don't do it. Shy away from it because that's going to be better for you. And you're never going to become successful in whatever it is, no matter what. And so many people have that problem I had it also too. So, um, and look where I'm at now. And it's not to say that I'm in a very great spot by any means. I'm very fortunate and blessed where I'm at, but it didn't happen overnight. And I too had my own struggles. I made stupid financial decisions in the past, really dumb ones. And also even after I started to get on track and build what I wanted to do, I still was limiting myself. I mean, even as much as late as last year, I was working with you, Brian and Dave, uh, an extent. I mean, remember you were there out of my office for two days last June. And one of the biggest fears I, I've had that was always holding me back, I feel, was my fear that I wouldn't be able to build something or do something great on my father would always have to do. And that was a big limiting factor for me where I would always tell myself as much as, yeah, I, I want to do this or I'm going to build this. I'm going to do something else, whatever it might be. In the back of my mind, I would say, I don't know if I can actually live up to what my father designed or what my father created. And guess what? I wasn't. I was never going any anywhere farther. And once I finally let go of that and said, no, fuck this, I am going to build something better than my dad ever set out to do. It's not a jab at my dad. I want to be able to say that's the way I could give back to him. I built something bigger than he set out to do. I will do this. I am going to be better than my dad. God damn it. I am better than my dad already. And guess what? It slowly started to materialize my mindset that, yeah, no. I am better, I can be better, and I will be building something bigger than he ever could have set out to imagine to build. And starting off on that mindset then has led me to now these paths and where I am. I, I feel that there's nothing happens, uh, we'll say by a chance. It, 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 everything happens in life for a reason. And that reason directly is uh, correlated to the actions and the choices that you make. Even getting out of bed consistently day in and day out, putting in the right effort to do certain things, it's all pattern that lead you right to where you are. If you aren't happy with where you're at, whether it's financially, spiritually, with your relationships or anything else, it's a direct result because of actions that you either took or didn't take. And to change it, you've got to take new actions and you will get different results. That's this basic principle that everything life and in wealth and finance especially, it is very, very prevalent, the mindset, because that's what causes so many people to make poor financial decisions to not invest or save money, but also to do really stupid things when you see the markets in periods of either high volatility or when the market is growing. And people, for example, last year, you would have thought it was going out of style. I mean, people were just throwing money at the stock market last year. The market's booming. It's up 21% from where it was in 2018. And things are going out of style, right? Well, Many of the people that we work with, we were telling them, you know what? No, we now need to start looking at alternative ways to invest money because you've made a lot. Let's start capturing some of your gains. Let's protect what you've already grown. Let's be a steward of that wealth and now find other avenues to start to secure that. So if something were to happen ever, 
you will see all of your wealth move in a downwards direction for a period of time. Guess what? We weren't doing it because we knew what was going to happen with coronavirus. We were doing it because we we're following our principles and we were consistent. We do it every single year. Right now, guess what? As this is happening, people are very, very happy because they didn't see their entire accounts do this. They saw part of their accounts go down because again, I'm not a wizard. I don't know what's going to happen in the stock market or what's going to happen to the world or the economy. If I did, I'd be a freaking trillionaire. I'd be charging everyone to talk to me a million bucks an hour or something like that, but I'm not there yet. So uh, because I don't know all that stuff, I have to follow principles and I have to consistently follow those. Otherwise things are going to break. And when you're dealing with wealth, you're dealing with someone's livelihood and their future. So you have to be very, very disciplined. And that discipline is what we carry on and teach to everyone that we work with. And that's why the second phase now pretty much of my life has been to do this, to talk to younger individuals, because I spent the earlier part of my career only working with either pre-retirees or retirees. They've already built their wealth. I'm helping manage their money for them to enjoy life and then to figure out how to distribute it to their next, next of kin and the next generations. What I really want to help though is how do I build up my generation, the millennials and anyone else, so they can have that same ability in the future. Because unfortunately, it hasn't been taught to us as much. And a lot of us think that for whatever reason, because of social media or anything else, that it's a lot easier to get than it really is. And it can happen overnight. And guess what? It doesn't work that way. And also, people fall victim then to the people that prey online, like these freaking gurus and everything else. That study these bullshit courses of how to do it. Like what you were saying, Dave, uh, Brian, sorry, not Dave, Brian, with the, uh, the Amazon courses or anything else. If it sounds too good to be true, it always is. There is no easy path to wealth. The only path to wealth is consistency, time, and discipline. That's it. If you are going to consistently invest money, if you will be disciplined about how you invest it and when you invest it and also when you don't pull out or divest, you will be okay in the long run. Those, that's the secret to wealth, and I can't be any more blatant than that. I want to. Uh, the interesting thing about that is when I finally surrendered to that that idea, like I, I just got to be consistent, let the compounding interest go. You know, um, I was older when I surrendered to that idea, and I thought to myself, I'm older, so it's going to be harder to, to save up all this money than the younger guy. But here's the funny part: when I totally released on that, and I was totally okay with that. Boy, did my wealth build fast. It started building really fast. And I was like, and I was like, well, technically, it's like I'm almost, it was almost like I, be, I became so unconsciously accepting of it that the universe rewarded me back. And so that's why I'm not even worried during this whole coronavirus thing, because we've got my money protected, covered in different ways. I lose some here, gain, you know, make some over there. Great. And, um, and I want to thank you for that, but, you know, part of it. But the whole idea of getting comfortable with this idea of, because compounding interest, when it does start to work, it works. It looks like magic when it finally kicks in and that, up, that upper part of the chart starts to kick up. You know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that, that compound interest also is, that's the hardest part for people to start to invest and in, to really think about their future. It's always ground, ground zero is the hardest part. Just like when you go to the gym, the hardest part will always be the first month or first two months of doing it. And investing is no different. I mean, you go to the gym and you put in all this work and effort you say, I want to get in shape. First off, if you say you want to get in shape, you have no goal. Your brain is not able to tell you anything. You can't quantify it. So all the people that are New Year's resolutionists and what you're going to see after this, the, the coronavirus resolutionists that now got fat because they're sitting at home and not doing anything. All of those people that go back to the gym are going to say, you know, I'm getting back in shape. I mean, I hear my mom say it even. <laughs> I keep telling her like, mom, no, you get a plan, all right? Lose 10 pounds. How much, how much did you gain? Oh, you lose, you gain five pounds, Bob. You gotta lose five pounds, and it's very, very. I mean, I'm deadly serious about that. Even though I'm joking of making light of the situation, but if you are specific, if you go to the gym and say, "I want to get a big ass if I'm a girl," "I want to get abs," or anything else, "I'm a guy," "I want to lose weight," you're not gonna do it just by saying that. You gotta be super specific, and the more specific you are, the more you can quantify it, and then you can track it. And so you go to the gym and say, I want to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks. That's one pound a week. You can track that. You could look every single day at the scale. Is your weight going up? Is it going down? What's happening? Now you can adjust the food that you're eating. How much are you taking in? You got to maybe cut back food or do more cardio. And what is the probability of success at the end of those 10 weeks? You may not actually have lost 10 pounds, but you're a hell of a lot closer than you were 10 weeks ago. And the same goes for investing. Many people 
when they start to design their investments for the future, they'll throw a couple grand in and expect this massive return. And then they go, yes, all right, I'm off to the races. It doesn't work that way. You got to consistently do it. But before you can even consistently do it, you got to think of where you want to get to. That's why I stress this. If you do that, you can now determine, all right, if I need to get to seven and a half million dollars by the time I'm 60, how much do I have to actually invest every single month? Well, if it's hypothetically $2,000 every month that you got to invest, now you know you're bringing in 15 grand a month. You better put $2,000 every way every single month and you better do it religiously because if you do that and you stay consistent to it, you're going to hit that goal. It's just a matter of when. It's not a Funny matter of when. For me, I started, to, I started first investing a while back with T. Harv Eker when he suggested this jar system money thing. So, and there was this idea that you put money away and you don't ever touch it. Uh, because it's a money magnet. It becomes this magnet that draws more abundance to you. Just like the law of attraction, the more you think about success, the more you get thoughts about success, the more su these successful uh, experiences show up in your life because that's where your mind is focused. The reticular activating is the system, reticular activating system of the brain looks for that and starts to sort for that and bring more of that in. And so I had that experience, that literal experience. Uh, as I started putting money away, I started to say, I nev I'm never going to spend this money except on investments they're going to bring me more money or on businesses that are going to bring me more passive income that's the only things i could spend it on and i said well what but i in the past what i'd always done was said to myself uh but i'm a little short on this bill i have to pull from this i can't pay this bill i'm gonna then so what i finally said was wait a minute i'll put the minimum amount away that i can put away and if i do have to pay a bill this month i'll renegotiate it i'll pay late i'll let my credit get damaged i'm not going to take from that money and the moment I made that decision, I never had that problem first off, but the willingness to lose it all to have my investment, my savings so that I could have some, the thought was I'd much rather take some dings on my credit now while I've learned this process so that I can have a true retirement when I'm older, real money in the bank. And when I finally got that mindset right and I started to invest properly, boy, did not only did that savings start to build and I had the money for all my bills, but the savings not only build, but it started to, um, my income started to increase to, to, to comp my income just kept, because as I had more money put away in investments, my, my belief around abundance started to grow. And as my belief around abundance grew, my income started to grow too. So the investments created more income, the income created more investments, and it's been an, a climb ever since. And what's happened is I just get more and more abundant. And what I thought was impossible as far as putting money away before starts to become not only possible, but I way have exceeded it. And they, oh, you got to put 2000 a month away. There was a time when I'd be like, ah, and then suddenly you're like, oh, that's easy. And then you're just like, I'll, I'll put more than that. I'll put three times, four times, five times more than that. And, and you guys will be shocked at how fast that process can happen. I wanted to say that for those of the guys that are scared about investing and getting their numbers together, this is what can change your life. Um, but uh, we're, we're 40, 50 minutes into the call. Do you want to, um, is there anything specific you want to get across to these guys today before, and then hop into questions or what do you want to do? No, I mean, honestly, the, the most important thing is if you look at money as a tool, you look at it that way and not as anything else. It's not there to get you a certain car or a house or a girl or a guy or anything else. Money is a tool. And if you think of it that way and you use it as a tool, things will look a lot different for you in the future. And then you start to be very consistent. Like we were just talking about the biggest takeaways from anything when I talk to people about money is investing. There's a thousand ways to invest money. There's a thousand ways to do anything in life, but the true key to success as far as building your wealth is consistency. That's it. That is literally it. If you are not going to consistently invest your money and have that plan to know where you're going to get to, and figure out what you need to do to get there along the way, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna hit whatever those goals may be. So you gotta be as specific as you possibly can and you gotta be consistent. That's the biggest takeaway I always want people to understand because in this world, especially uh, because of social media and how interconnected we are, there is so much bullshit out there. There's so much misinformation. There's thousands of ways that you can go look at doing this and doing that. And most of them are always wrong. And people love to give advice especially on social media. And it's, it's amazing how if I go on right now and I make a post uh, on my Instagram page or on my story and say, if you buy five turtles today and five turtles tomorrow, that's going to guarantee you the keys to success in life. 
Like that's the dumbest fucking thing ever, but I pretty much guarantee you some people will follow it. And the reason I say that is I put a picture when I flew down to Florida over Christmas. I was on a Delta Airlines flight flying in the back of the plane and I was sitting next to the window. I made the person next to me take a picture with my ear earbuds in looking out the window and I'm going like this and I got this $25 watch on and I fake looking watch to look really expensive and all this stuff and I did it for a reason not to look like a complete idiot because my neighbor sitting next to me thought I was the biggest idiot on the planet was because I posted that on Instagram and said I'm going to create a course on how to travel on a private plane and blah 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 and have uh, all the success how many people wanted that course DM me? I literally got 56, I counted, 56 people that day messaged me like, hey, where do I get this course? Are you serious? Like, I was like, this is terrible because people think it's easy. And that's the problem is people have that mindset where they want immediate gratification and they don't want to put in the work, but they also don't want to do anything. They want someone to hand to them and people then spend the money to give to someone else to hopefully provide them all of the success they want and it's never going to work. So you got to put in the work, you got to have the mindset and you got to consistently build your wealth over many, many years. You do that, you're going to be okay in life. I can promise you that. So um, I'm going to take, I'm going to give you takeaways. There's some takeaways here. You got to be very specific on your goals. Like you know exactly the type of house where you want it, the size, the cost, you knew exactly the type of cars you wanted. So those are your specifics and by what age, um, you want consistency. Uh, slide, we talk about the slight edge and the power of consistency. Um, you saw, and then, uh, so if you're specific, you're going to be yeah. stepping into tension because the more specific you are on a goal, the more tension because of the, the, the reality of that goal hits home. If you're consistent, you create more tension because you're stepping into that goal and you get more comfortable with tension. This is the key. This is why we always talk about tension here and getting good with tension. Then the, the next piece is to follow through with all that and to really stay super consistent over the long run is you got to build self-trust, which I've been talking a lot about lately and wanted to create a program around is this idea that without self-trust, you will not follow through on your dreams because you won't trust yourself. And if you don't trust yourself to do the things you say you're going to do, then that needs to be fixed first and foremost in your life or your whole life will go to shit. Self-trust is everything because then self-trust, if you have all three of these, you're specific, you're consistent. You have the self-trust that I know what I say I'm going to do, which goes back to consistent. You got tension galore, but that's going to build self-esteem, self-love, and self-confidence all along the way. And then you'll have a great life. And these are the, these are the takeaways I'm getting right now. And I'm adding the self-trust piece. So um, uh, that's very, that's very important. I like that. I'm going to have to actually add that to my talks now too, because <laughs> it's true. If you don't trust yourself either, that was one of the big things for me. I didn't trust myself to build things bigger or to go after much larger ambitions. I, I had that self doubt and that was limiting me. It really was. Cool. Cool. That's it. Yeah, it's something I really want to create a big, uh, a, a, like a three month training program around is rebuilding your own self trust. We get a lot of people that won't take a program, not because they don't believe we can help them or they won't invest with you because they don't believe they can, you can help them. It's because they don't trust themselves to mm -hmm. actually tell them to do i'm gonna fail anyways what's the point and they they get they, they or they go into denial about all that and just avoid and they avoid doing the work they avoid because they just don't want to fail again because they have no self-trust and that can be rebuilt and that and if that's not rebuilt everything all your dreams in your life go little by the wayside and you end up that old guy in the senior home filled with regrets about all the things you didn't do so mm -hmm. that's what, that's why i've been harping on it lately um you want to go to questions bud yeah, sure. Let's do it. I'm not sure if I'm frozen on my side then or not because I don't see any questions. So <laughs> uh, I'm here on the Q and A, but you do keep freezing. Your picture keeps freezing, um, and but your voice has been fine. So, so for everybody out there, we still got that voice. Yeah, a lot of people are commenting on your voice how, how they like your voice. So perfect. Um, okay, I'll give you the questions, Nikki. Right. So uh, Nikki wrote this one at eleven oh seven. So we're gonna start with the earliest questions. We've got sixteen right now. So. All right. Let's try to answer them uh, succinctly. I was wondering what type of mutual funds you'd recommend for long-term high growth. There's just so many different ones through uh, different places. Example, Vanguard, Fidelity. Are these good places to start? Was looking into starting one though a, uh, a, a through a Roth IRA, uh, any thoughts? All right, so to tackle two questions kind of one. Um, the Roth part I won't really touch on as much because the Roths can be more dependent upon how you want to receive your, your money in the future, your investment. 
uh, for anyone else that's not familiar with uh, what Mickey was asking though, you have two types of IRA accounts and IRA accounts are, stands for individual retirement. It's how you can invest money in today's dollars that will grow either tax deferred or tax free for the future. You have a traditional IRA, which is where you invest money and it's tax deferred, meaning directly whatever you invest into a traditional IRA is deducted from your income tax. So you're not paying tax on that money because it's grown deferred until you take the money out way down the road. So when you're retired and you're taking that money out, you're paying the income tax at that point in time. And a Roth is growing tax free because you're paying for it in today. So if you're gonna invest money into the Roth, whatever you invest into a Roth, that amount dollar for dollar is added as income to your tax return and you're paying for that tax today because now that investment will grow tax free for life. There, each one can make sense. It's dependent upon your financial situation. So because there's 76 people on this call, I, I don't wanna to even touch that because everyone's gonna be different. So what works for one person may not work for the other, but that's the basis of how they each work. Now, in regards to investments for the future, as far as the platforms, again, for looking at mutual funds or any other types of investments, I will ever on an open platform talk about a specific one because again, there's many different nuances to that. So what again works for one person may not work for someone else. But what I will say is if you are looking at funds, whether it's a mutual fund or an exchange trade fund, because they're very similar and a mutual fund and exchange trade fund, the number one way to think about them is you're buying a basket of investments or you're buying a cookie jar. It's, it's the even better way I love to describe it. So if you buy one stock or one bond, you're buying a cookie at a bakery. And if Brian eats your cookie, guess what? You lost your investment. If your cookie goes stale, you lost your investment. It's the same principle. You don't want to buy just one stock or potentially one bond or have one real estate position in your portfolio, because if that one goes bad, something happens, you could potentially lose your investment. Instead, you want to diversify. So that's the whole concept between or behind uh, mutual funds and exchange trade funds. Instead of having one cookie, you go to the baker and you're buying a jar of cookies. So there's many, many different cookies inside that jar. So if Brian eats one or one goes stale, he's still got many other cookies in that jar to protect you. And the only big difference between mutual fund and exchange trade fund or ETF is what everyone calls them. A mutual fund has a baker that is managing it. So they have someone, a human being that manages that fund and an ETF is all driven by computer. So think of a mutual fund, like you're going to a local bakery, buying a jar of cookies, fresh out of the oven and an ETF, you're buying a box of Oreos that's been processed by a machine. That's the big difference in how they work. Now there's costs associated with that. Obviously the Oreos could be cheaper than the cookie jar that you're buying from baker because they're made by a machine versus a real baker. So with a mutual fund, you have a mutual fund manager, you're gonna have a higher cost to it. And it's called an expense ratio. So the one thing I always suggest to anyone before you do any investments with a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund is you wanna look at what the expense ratio is and compare that against others because every single one's different. And if you're paying a higher expense ratio, that means it's taking away from your rate of return. And very simple, if the expense ratio says 1%, that means if that fund were to grow by 10%, you are only getting nine, the mutual fund manager or the ETF itself is collecting the other amount. So you wanna be very careful when you're doing this because there are some that have very, very high expense ratios and then there are some that have lower. Now, I will say Vanguard does have very low expense ratios. Doesn't mean it's the best out there, but they are very competitive as far as their price and expense ratios for both their mutual funds and their ETFs. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, next one, uh, Marinos. Uh, hey, Brian. Hi. Hello, Brian and Jonathan. Jonathan, do you agree that in the age of social media? Oh, that's, uh, I, that's what I did see. I, I kind of talked about at the very beginning because at the very end is when I said the consistency. Uh, he already answered his own question. <laughs> Christian uh, writes, can you comment on investing in real estate these days, like uh, buying the, the dip, um, starting small? let's say a home so expensive these days. Uh, so, uh, so on a major metro area, HCOL, that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, as far as real estate investing, the one thing I will tell anyone is 
you want to buy something that's going to be multifamily, no matter what you do, unless you want to get into it for flipping. I don't ever do it. I don't have any personal properties that are flipped or anything else. And I don't really give advice on it because I am here to really act as the steward for someone's wealth. I'm here to build it and then to aggressively protect it. And so when you look at real estate, there's, of course, you want to do your due diligence to figure out what areas of the country are going to be number one right now, more susceptible to being able to purchase at the right price versus where are areas that are maybe overvalued. And that depends upon what you're looking for. But the other big thing is, if you're going to purchase a property, the biggest takeaway is do something that might be multifamily. Even if you're starting off, you could find a duplex. And the reason I say that, if you buy a single family home for an investment property, not for a flip, but for an investment property, let's say your mortgage is $2,000 a month and you're going to charge $2,500 a month rent, you're great as long as you have a tenant. Well, think of it in case that's happening right now, and in, I should say an instance that's happening right now, where if the economy goes sideways, your tenant may not be able to pay you. And the government even said, you can't evict people right now because of the coronavirus, because they might've lost their job. So if you have just one property and you've got to pay $2,000 a month and now you don't have $2,500 a month coming in, you got nothing. Well, now you're putting money out. Instead, you help to mitigate that risk and diversify by being in a multifamily setup. So at least a duplex, Maybe one side of it's covering part of that mortgage and the other family doesn't have a job for a period of time, or you just don't even have a tenant. Well, now you've got a $2,000 a month mortgage for two units. On one side, you're charging X amount. The other side, you're charging X amount. Let's say you're just charging each side 1500 bucks. Okay, you may not be able to pay the full mortgage payment by just the rents, but at least it's a lot less risk than paying the full mortgage payment for a single family home. Uh, does that make sense? At least I hope it does. <laughs> Totally oh, does. Yeah, totally. Um, well, you know, I was lucky. I remember years ago, I, I was studying business from Mark Allen. He's a, he's a spiritual teacher, but he's also a business guy. And he said, you know, you got to have a certain amount. You are you required to have a certain amount of backup funds whenever you run a business, even your personal account, separate from your business to back up your business with your personal account. And I remember saying this many years ago, and, and Dave and I have really done well with this is always making sure that the business has a certain amount of backup funds separate from the business in our personal accounts. And it's just when, you know, when a time like this hits, you go, Oh, that's why I was doing that all that time for a long time. You're just sitting there with that money and you're like, what do you do yeah. with it? Well, yeah. here's a, look, look at just, uh, as we talked over the past couple of weeks and you would ask, is there money that you should uh, start to deploy to invest? And I was like, actually, no, right now, keep everything in cash that you've got right now, yep. simply because we don't know where the world's going to take us. I mean, this experience that we're going through is shining a light on just how mismanaged this country really is as far as money. I mean, we are the biggest economy, I would argue, at least the most advanced economy on the planet. And in one fucking week, because of all the sensationalized headlines, our country was brought to its knees. I mean, that's, this is fucking insane how in one week we went from a superpower to almost a third world country as far as how the economy is structured. And now we are having to write out trillions of dollars just to keep companies afloat. I mean, no one was practicing anything as far as having a cash reserve. And that's another thing, it's insanity where even keeping a six month reserve, there is none of that. All these businesses are operating at so tight levels that in one week time, they're all going bankrupt. That's insanity. And yeah. Quite frankly, I think a lot of them deserve to go out of business. I, I know it means losing jobs. I feel bad for those people, but the companies are so piss poorly mismanaged that I, I don't feel bad for the company. I feel bad for the employees, but the, the managing staff of the company, I don't feel bad for them one damn bit because they caused this. And same with the airlines. Uh, look at how they all, I mean, and I understand you don't have money coming in. It doesn't matter what your business is. Uh, Dave and Brian, if they don't have people that are paying to, work with them. If I don't have people that are investing money with me and paying me a fee, it doesn't matter how well you structure your plan. If you go a year without income, I don't care what business you are, you're going to be screwed. But you at least have some time to reorganize and figure out how can you make things adjust? How do you sidestep the situation and plan to, to come out of it better? But most companies didn't even do that. And that's why you saw everyone caught with their pants down around their ankles right now and why a lot of things are happening the way they are. It really sucked, and I'm sure you can tell my voice it infuriates me because these are basic things I teach people all the time and talk about, and at the top level of our country, it's not being followed, 
And now all of a sudden you're going to see the government write trillions of dollars of checks to a lot of companies. And it's all going to do the same thing it's done before. No one's going to learn a damn thing. They're going to take the cash. They'll survive. And they'll go right back to the same method of operation for the next decade until this happens again and go, Ooh, I didn't know. I didn't know this was going to happen. I can't believe it. I'm bankrupt right now. <laughs> I agree. I agree. This is where it's, you know, there's got to be a balance between bailouts and uh, and actual people have taken responsibility for their for their uh, for their cash reserves and making shit happen when shit like this happens. Um, and what that balance is, I don't know 100 percent. No, but it's got to be something. Um, so are we entering a recession? Will people lose their jobs soon? It's asking that. And then just what's your opinion on that? I mean, people are losing jobs. People have lost jobs. So, uh, that check mark, yeah, it's happened. And it's probably going to continue to happen. It'll precipitate for some time. This is far from over yet. Um, as far as a recession, stay tuned. I don't know. I, it can go either way. If anything, China, China came back pretty good, right? They didn't come back as people thought they were going to, you know, when they started all getting back to work, I heard they got back to like 75% of where they were, 80% pretty fast. Um, I don't know what the. Uh, yeah. I mean, the bigger thing is, even if we don't go into a recession right now, and it, it, it is possible that we could have a recession, because again, recession, people think that this big bad word, like, ooh, recession is bad. All recession is, is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That's it. That, that, that doesn't, that's it. Nothing else. So we could absolutely have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. I would not be shocked. And if we do, guess what? Boom. <laughs> we had a recession. Now, recessions, you don't really know right away when they're happening. So we could, could we be entering it right now? Have we been in it for a month? Mm, I have no freaking clue. And on the offset of it, when will we get out of it? Again, it depends on how we react to this situation, how quickly we get people back to work and stuff moving again in this country. The bigger concern that's not talked about is the financial ramifications and the long-term ramifications of printing $2 trillion for the bailouts. Because all we're doing is we're adding that to our line of debt in this country. And think if you're a, just any of us, if we go to the bank and take out $2 million and have no financial way to pay it back, what's going to happen? Eventually, we're going to default on that. And you're, the roosters will come home, <laughs> or the chickens will come to roost, I should say. And that's going to happen eventually. And no one, no one in Washington is talking about that. No one in the news is talking about that. That, to me, is the greatest issue out of all of this. It's not a recession or the market sung off. It's what's going to happen in the next five or the next maybe 10 Recessions years. Recessions are part of life. They happen, yeah. every, they happen all the time. And, and really good businessmen make money even during recession. Matter of fact, the really good ones usually make more during recession to often. But from what I've seen, um, but this debt thing, it grows every year. Every, every president adds more to the, to the debt and mm -hmm. never talks about really they talk about it when they're being elected paying some of it back but nobody ever really does no never it never does you're kicking the can down the road yeah democrat or republican they just keep until eventually we're gonna have to pay for it some eventually so um i'm glad you brought that up because that's a very important point um what's your uh opinion on investing i love this question because i know <laughs> you're investing in crypto or gold due to uh a, a, the probability of upcoming hyperinflation well, that, that's Dave's fucking fairy tale investment right there. Uh, Not a fairy tale, baby. It's reality. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. hoping you would actually go on and. I mean, my personal opinion as far as cryptocurrency is concerned is it's like gambling right now. I, it's, I don't know where it's going to be in the next couple of years, the next decade. The technology behind it's fascinating. It has potential, very good ramifications for the future and benefits, but it's in its infancy and anything that's infancy, we'll see where it goes. What I tell anyone when it comes to crypto, stick to the big coins, the ones that stuff is actually going to be based off of. So you have the big three, essentially with Litecoin, Ethereum, and Bitcoin being the grandfather. Most codes are based off of those. If you stick with that and you put in enough that you don't care if it goes to zero, put it in, forget about it, check back in a decade see what happened. If you grew, great. You're happy. You've made some good money. If not, oh, well, it didn't bankrupt you. Um, but a lot of people look at that and they treat it as like this new way to get rich quick. And I always love to harp on 2017 because I get a call from Dave every single day about how high Bitcoin was going. It was going up and 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 up. And it's the new big thing. Now, Dave was smart though about it. He didn't put all of his money into it. He was putting some into it that he didn't care if it went to zero. 
right? Same thing, because we've talked about this. But there were other people that, in that period of time, because they saw how much was running up, were remortgaging their freaking homes and stuff like that because they thought that this was going to make them a millionaire in the next couple of months. And guess what? In spectacular fashion, it's been crashing down in December of 2017. It's never even recovered to half of that value where it was. And so people lost. Uh, 6950 right now. Where is it at? Uh, 6950, 6950. Yeah. yeah, it was at almost 20,000. So people lost millions and millions of dollars. Now, if you're holding it and you're going to check on it in the next decade or you want to put in a little bit, just the amounts that you don't care about, that's okay. And that's really all I'll say about crypto because there's not a lot to know about it yet. I, I don't know enough about it and what its validity is going to be in the future. The one thing I would just say though also about it, don't buy the bullshit coins that come up all the time because it's like every day there's a new coin pretty much. Stick to what's out there that was the originals. And then for precious metals, uh, they have their place in portfolios and not just gold. Um, gold seems for whatever reason, the one that everyone focuses on, silver second. Um, metals themselves, I would say you want to focus on what's going to be relevant for the current uh, environment. So what's going to be essentially the necessity over the next couple of years? Are you going to need more gold than you would silver? Maybe palladium? Are you going to need more cobalt or something else? You want to look at all those. And so looking at from a conceptual standpoint, gold right now is just up and down. It moves because people use it as a, another form of currency. But as far as a, an investment itself for true growth, I'll say you want to look at other areas such as like palladium or lithium, things like that, because they're used in a lot of things nowadays, like catalytic converters, batteries, I mean, lithium ion batteries. There's a huge need for that because vehicles are going to be transformed over the next decade to where pretty much everything, as much as this pains me to say, hybrid, uh, it's going to make me want to kill myself. Um, but that's the direction everything's going. So you have a demand for it. So you're not a Tesla guy? Come on, man. <laughs> I, hate, I hate. I mean, I, I, it doesn't have a sound. There's no noise. There's no motion. It's like driving in a giant egg to me, at least. That's my <laughs> But be as it may. That's what I'll say as far as like with metals. The one thing I'll say that is stupid, though, is the people that go out and buy um, precious metals, whether it's gold or anything else, and they just hold on to it at their house. That's just stupid. And the reason I say that, anyone if, that goes and buys a bunch of gold bricks and puts in their house, I've got this really, really, really awesome precious metal in the form of copper and lead. And what I do is I melt the lead down and I form a bullet. And then I use the copper as the brass, I'm sorry, brass for the casing. And then I can shoot you and I take your gold bars. That is, that's, I don't like precious metals if you're holding on to them. If you do it, you can trade them on indexes where they peg one-to-one -one what that precious metal is trading for, and you can get in and out very quickly. Whereas if you're holding the physical precious metal, you have to go to someone that's going to be willing to buy it off you, and they're going to negotiate with you. So always do stuff that you can easily get into and get out of. So I guess one takeaway I should have said earlier is liquidity is very important in everything that you do. You want to be able to have a certain amount of your investments always liquid, meaning you can easily get out of them because if you can't, you get trapped with everyone else then in essentially the house fire and you can't get out. And that's what happened, for example, a few weeks ago with the market when it came just crashing down. So many people were trying to run out and then people got stuck at the exits they couldn't get out. And the analogy I always use for this is it's like a movie theater when you invest and this goes for any type of investment. Going into an investment usually is very orderly, and especially in the stock market, it's orderly on the way in, or there's that rush of excitement. So it's like everyone going to see the new Star Wars or something. Everyone's running into the movie theater to get in. Well, let's say halfway through that movie theater, I walk in and I throw a grenade in the middle of that movie theater. What's going to happen? First off, it's going to wipe out a couple of people. Well, that's the initial sell-off. People get wiped out right away. Everyone else is then going to freak the hell out and want to run for the exits. And if you only have two exits, and all these people running at the same time, it's going to create a bottleneck where only a few are getting out. That's called liquidity. And it's a bitch because that's the number one reason why people lose money on investments. If it's whatever the investment is, is a hundred bucks and you can't get out of it until 80 bucks, you're losing money. No way around it. You don't get out exactly what you wanted. You get out what the market's willing to pay you for it. So that's something that's also very important to understand is you always want to be liquid to a certain degree, but you want to understand how liquidity works. That's a very important thing. But you know what taught me to, it's the one thing that I really love about Bitcoin is it really taught me to not freak out with the uh, markets rising and falling. <laughs> I, I got you need a steel stomach. Yeah, at first I was like a mess and then I got used to it and then pretty soon <laughs> I 
yeah, it's just the market. It's what it does. You know, and then I stopped worrying about money so much and my life got so much better. Um, and I've still got my Bitcoin investments there. They're, you know, I'm in the Bitcoin mainly. I think I'm all in Bitcoin now. And um, yeah, it'll do what it does. And I got plenty of other investments. I'm not worried about it. Um, okay. Uh, okay. This is a good question. Simple question from Sonnet. Can you give us some practical ways to invest right now? Practical ways to invest. I mean, one of them would be what I talked about earlier, um, figuring out it, where you want to be as far as especially a house. That calculator is actually really important because um, a lot of people don't realize this, but the house that you live in will absolutely determine the lifestyle that you lead. And it's why when you see older individuals downsize their house, I'm sure 90% of people on this call have heard at some point someone is downsizing. Well, they don't downsize because they can't, uh, they, they want to have a smaller house. They downsize because they can't afford that lifestyle per se. They need to tighten up their budget. That's why most people actually really truly downsize. And so to avoid those pitfalls, you want to start by figuring out exactly where you want to be first so you can get there. Now, other practical things to do are, even if you do not think that you're ready to begin investing large amounts, uh, what you would consider a large amount, whatever it may be, if you do to start, if you start now though, you could still theoretically save and have over a million dollars over a multi-year period, even if you're putting away five bucks. I mean, if you were to save on a daily basis, even say a dollar, and you kept doing that every single day, and then if you, as you start to increase your income, okay, let's put $2 away every single day of that. Eventually, let's get to $3. If you even start right there. Yeah, you know, I, I, started with, I started with my change at the end of each day. I wouldn't spend my change. I buy something, they gave me the change, and I just throw it in a bucket. That's how I started. And I'd save that change. And that's, that was the beginning of my savings. And then I wouldn't spend that money for anything but another investment. And then eventually you transfer that change to into the bank, you put it in your, simple. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the most practical way to start is go after that. Mm -hmm. And it changed my whole life. Uh, up until then, I couldn't save money to save my life. And after that, I started, suddenly money just started compounding. It was like that bucket became a, a magnet for more because that's yeah. the way my mind thinks more, more, more. I still have it. I actually have all the original change. I never, it's a big bucket I keep of all this. And it, it just, because it, then it led to a bank account, which led to more, which led to more. And, yeah. it, and it's really that easy, guys. It, and then, but also you've done it to where now you've built it up to where it was maybe a couple of cents at the very beginning or a few dollars here and there. Now is consistently, routinely, every single month, we're putting away very large quantities based on the routine and yep. it didn't happen overnight. I mean, how old are you, Brian? Again, 51? Yep. 51. So started this many years ago and you're now at that point. So, but look at the trajectory. It didn't do this. It was slow start, slow start, slow start. And now all of yep. a sudden at the end, and I don't mean to say it like you're going to be dying anytime soon, but I should say where we are right now, it's, trajectory is going up and exponentially increasing simply because of number one, the consistency you put in all those years, your investments as they grow, that amount is always proportionally bigger every single year, no matter what. So as you grow with the investments, the compound interest of 8% on a thousand dollars is a lot different than 8% on a hundred thousand dollars. And then you just continue repeating that all the time. That's very, very powerful. And that's one of the things I'd say to right there is the most practical thing. Start now, start small and consistently increase it and it will build. You know what I love about working with Jonathan guys is how excited he gets about my money. <laughs> <laughs> he gets on the phone. Oh my God, look what you're going to have when you're the, look what's going to happen here. And if we do this and he gets so excited, it transfers to me. And by the time I get off the call, I'm like, I feel like I'm a billionaire. And uh, he does this to me all the time and it makes me want to talk to him more and work on more money stuff with him. So oh, yeah. no, he's very good at that. You know, unlike most uh, financial guys who are like, oh, well, we could, you know, more serious. He's not like that. Um, hey, Jonathan. Yes. Um, you know, we, we can sit here until we're blue in the face telling people not to buy Bitcoin, not to buy speculative stuff, not to go buy physical precious metals. But, you know, there's people that are still going to go do that. Oh, yeah. And, no, nothing wrong and, with that. I'm not saying not to do that. Right, right, right. But um, what I what I wanted to say is the if you're going to be buying like speculative stuff, and I want to get your opinion on this, 
um, just so other guys can can hear it from somebody other than than you know you. When when I buy speculative stuff, i.e., crypto, when I make that purchase, I, I literally think to myself, I'm throwing this money in the trash can. And that way, I don't care what happens to it either way. So like you're saying, if it goes down, if it goes up, that's great. And that's the kind of mindset you need to have when you're dealing with highly volatile, highly speculative stuff like Bitcoin. Now, mm -hmm. in my personal opinion, there's two ways to look at crypto. Uh, long term for its uh, uh, technical abilities, you know, the, the, for the technology of, of blockchain and what it is and, the, and what's happening in the financial system and contracting world uh, as far as big contracts go, I think it's amazing. And I think that's a very, very, very long-term play. Yeah. But if you're trying to make short uh, trades and quick money in this, I, I think you're pretty foolish. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like anything that's, anything that's speculative. You want to you want to be in it for the long haul. I mean, yeah, and most... and and a lot of people want to go and make this quick money. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that we'll sit here and talk about this, and guys will still try and go do it. Um, the mindset for doing something like that is it has to be throwaway money. It's no different than going to Vegas and gambling on the roulette table or blackjack. And that's kind of the point I wanted to get across. And if you have any kind of debt. What, what are your thoughts on somebody that's in debt? Should they be investing? Should they not be investing? They should, but there should be a plan in place. So someone, I mean, everyone's got debt of some, I should not say, but most people have debt in some way, whether it's with credit cards, student loans, a house, a car, whatever. Debt's not bad per se. People look at debt sometimes as being bad, but debt used the wrong way is bad. If you use debt to your advantage, and I love when I say I use other people's money for my car, like the McLarens, I'm never, I mean, I paid 50,000 is what I will say. I paid for each McLaren because that's what I put down on the cars. The rest of it was the bank's money. It was everyone else's money that afforded that car to me because the investments are paying. That. So I'm never going to liquidate anything uh, from my investments that can jeopardize my future growth trajectory. So having debt isn't bad. Now, if you are starting off, you've got a ton of debt before you've ever invested, you want to have a plan to figure out how do you pay down that debt in a reasonable period of time. And whether it's the student loans or credit cards or something else, you want to figure out how do you have a consistent plan to pay that debt down, but also to make sure that that debt then doesn't reoccur. Otherwise, you're just uh, fighting fire with fire. It's not going to work. And at the same time, then you can devise a plan to systematically invest alongside it. So like many people that I work with, especially at my age, have student loan debt or some sort of credit card debt. And what we'll look at is, well, how much money do they have coming in? And what is the debt that they have? But also not only what is the debt that they have and what kind of debt, what's the interest rate? Because that's also very important. If you have an interest rate on debt that's 20%, I, I, don't, I don't care what I invest you in. I'm not taking 20%. So it might be more advantageous to focus more priority in paying that debt down first um, in some capacity. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have to invest and just put all the money in debt. You want to look at other alternative ways to move that debt, to play around with debt. So credit cards, for example, one thing that people uh, sometimes don't take advantage of are balance transfers. And you could have a 22% interest credit card that you got $10,000 on. If you could transfer that into a balance transfer card, and you pay 3% to transfer that. So you're going to pay 3% of your $10,000 to move it. So you're going to pay such a 300 bucks um, to move it over onto now a balance transfer card. And for the next 18 months, it's zero interest. And that goes to say 30%. Well, in 18 months, you can now whack down all of that debt. And at the same time, the added debt then in 18 months now, and you could start investing or you even take a small piece of the pie along the way and start investing. Same, you could do that with your student loan debt if your student loan allows for it. There's many ways to handle it, but you just got to figure out first off, where's your debt at? What's the interest rate? Because that's the most important thing. And from there, then you could start to build a plan to do it. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool, man. Yeah, I just, I just wanted you to talk about that because, you know, in times like this, people get desperate and, and they, mm -hmm. they go for those gurus and those quick rich scheme, get, get rich quick schemes. And, and, you know, crypto is definitely enticing. 
you know, investing in speculative stuff with a ton of debt is enticing because um, people are, people's backs are up against the wall. And, you know, you have to understand that this is building wealth is a, a long-term mm -hmm. um, proposition. And if you want to gamble, just go to Vegas. <laughs> go to any casino. <laughs> no. You know, any mods. You know what changed? There was an interesting story that changed my life. And I was at a, uh, I think it was a T. Harv Eckerd's Millionaire Mind event. And they had a woman on there that talked about savings. She talked about the, the JAR program, which I talked about where I was saving my change and building my financial freedom account, which is my money magnet. And she said she did that. She couldn't save much. So she started with a, a really small amount. Maybe it was $10 a month. It's all she could say because she was, she was in debt. But, you know, but the, here was the thing is even though she had the debt to pay, she saved a little bit to build the habit. Even if it's a tiny amount, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, I'm never going to touch it. I'm never going to use it to pay a bill. I'm going to use it to build my financial freedom account. And the rest I'll go. And, and her mindset was like, well, I don't know how this is going to make me money. But what happened was by putting that money away on a regular basis, uh, the mind started to slowly get used to that. And because whatever you focus on expands, a little bit more got put away and a little bit more got put away. And they said, as of today, right now, she's putting away 10 grand a month into her freedom account and using that for investments that's compounding and she didn't even she couldn't fathom how she could even put 100 away when she started it just built itself yeah. and uh, and so i think even if you got a, a large amount of debt if you're even if you're just putting your change away every month to build that habit and get that account started to to compound is so important yeah pay down the the higher interest rate uh bought the bulk of it first but have a little bit going in building that nest egg right away get that consistency going and so just a thought I had, and I, and I think it's a, a super important thought. Um, let's read the net. We got a couple more. It's 1227. Uh, I think we're gonna have to end soon. So what I'm gonna do, do you wanna try to answer a few of these in like a minute or less and see if you can do something? Less? Uh, all right, well, Randall asked opinion on Vanguard ETFs. Kind of redundant because I answered that a little bit already about just the expense ratio. I don't know specifically that on the list to ticker of. Um, there's many funds out there, so I don't use a lot of Vanguard funds. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, look for the expense ratios. Uh, let's see here. Uh, right. Which yeah, book that John has written also? Do you reference the people have been referencing the book in the chat? We haven't talked about your book. So yeah. Um, so I can do a quick plug. Um, I have a website. It is startmakingit.com. And that is the website that links directly to uh, my book. So I did write a book about um, investment and financial planning, really focused towards millennials, but it can be applied by anyone of any age. And actually, because I uh, came prepared, this is what the book looks like. <laughs> so, that's the actual uh, car. Yeah, this is, this is not a rented guru bullshit car. That, that's the first one that I visualized getting. Um, but the book does cover in a very, what I think, similar format to this call today. Um, it's kind of like going to the bar with me and having me there for 170 pages talking about the principles of money, mindset around money, and the right way to start investing. So this book is by no means going to give you um, every single step along the way. But if you are very unfamiliar with investing or just want to figure out where's the place to start, that's the purpose of this book. Um, and maybe one day I'll write another one to get more in the weeds on investing. But for right now, this is really set for just the very beginner that is wanting to learn and begin. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Okay, this is, um, all right. Uh, my questionnaire is frozen. I'm stuck where it's anonymous. It says something about there's momentum. I'll read it to you really quick. We'll just try to, we'll try to do two or three more really quick and then we'll call it a day. Okay. Uh, Rod, uh, what if my goal is more of the artistic kind, being a successful artist, musician, or writer? It's not uh, quantifiable. There's a bajillion of aspiring artists out there, and it's often either uh, uh, rags or riches with no in-between. How, how to go about uh, with that? Totally. Make, make your goal specific. And he's saying, yeah. I can't make my goal specific. I'm an artist. What do you think uh, of that? It, it's still quantifiable. Yeah. Where do you want to, where do you want to perform at? How about that? Um, so is it, uh, I, it, Nimrod, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Um, so for being a musician and I can talk about this a little bit because I, I do play piano. So I used to, when I was younger, I would play competitive piano. And um, one thing I wanted to always do was play um, at Carnegie Hall. I thought it'd be really cool to play at Carnegie Hall in front of everyone um, for a competition with piano. So it kind of shows my, my nerdy artistic side. And that was a goal. 
And it was quantifiable because I couldn't just walk up and knock on the door and say, hey, I want to be at a concert and play. I had to be able to get selected to get in there. So I had to go through a whole process to figure out, well, how do I get there? And uh, what song do I need to play? How do I pass the adjudication for uh, the local college levels and then continue to build up from there? Um, and when I say local college levels, that's where they would host um, these competitions. So my goal was I want to get there and play. That, I didn't care if I would get paid from it or anything else. I just wanted to play there and be in front of everyone. And I wanted that feeling of just fucking killing it and then standing up and everyone standing and applauding. Like that literally was what I wanted. And uh, I, I did it. So it, I did it because I went through that, that process. So I'd say right to you, you say on the side of being a successful musician, you can't quantify it. You absolutely can. Where, what, what do you want to, what do you want to do with your music? Do you want to play in a small wedding setup? Do you want to play for a local um, college or something else or a local venue? Or do you want to play on a massive wide audience, like a massive uh, stage? I can't think of my words. Play on a big stage in front of thousands of people. That's quantifiable. You can figure that out and then you can figure out, well, how do you get there? Now, the money part, that's entirely separate to that. But if that is your goal just to be a musician, figure out what you need to do. What are the pieces of the pie you need? Do you need to become part of a band? Can you do it by, are you trying to be a solo act? What kind of music are you trying to play? All of those things you can figure out. What, what do people like listening to really? And you can kind of quantify and figure out how do you do it? At least that, that's my argument. And I go. might be, I might be too positive on things, but I love, I always look for the optimistic way for everything in life. I don't look at life as there, there is no such thing as no to me. I mean, and I think that's one thing that Dave and Brian can say, I don't take no for a fucking answer, no matter what it is. If, if I want it, I'm going to have it. I'm going to go after it because I want it. I, in my mind, I've already decided it's going to happen. So I got to go after it and I just got to figure out how I'm going to do it. I think it's a great answer. Let's get to the next question because we're, we're, I want to get at least a couple more in before we close this call. We're running out of time. Um, uh, there's a momentum to reach a certain level of mindset clarity about a topic that comes in stages. Uh, you can't have clarity of step five when you're at step one, but what about when you have chronic mindset and clarity issues when you can't see the first step due to confusion and unclarity? Uh, it's an interesting question and I disagree with them. You can have clarity about what you want step five to be whether it actually ends up that way or not, you can picture what the end step looks like and what yeah. you want. You don't have to know all the steps in between though. Yeah. So you want to say anything to that? I think we kind of covered it earlier. Yeah, I think uh, so too. Let's, let's yeah, see. talking about the, the, keeping the, uh, the end goal in mind. Yeah, to keep the end goal in mind, let everything else in, and the starting goal, end goal, let everything else in between yeah. take care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, the Eric Plum, hey Eric, buddy. Uh, I love Eric, so I want to make sure I got his question. Hey, what's up Eric? Uh, I owe Eric a call too. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. So uh, do you have a specific, this is an interesting question. Do you have a specific investment strategies you recommend for disposable income, not retirement in the current volatile market? So disposable income right now, no, at the moment. And the reason being is the market is all over the map. We don't know what's heads or tails. Now for disposable income, the way that I would play this on the offset is to be very boring and go after number one, stocks that I think are going to be around, not only over the next couple of weeks, but the next couple of years, what are the companies that are going to be around? So the things that come to mind and uh, everyone is listening, this, this is not advice and I'm not recommending that you go out and follow this, but just personal opinion. Um, if you have disposable income right now, look for companies that will be around long-term. So your Amazons, your Apples, those companies, everyone got, sh got slacked a couple of weeks ago, as far as the market and their stock prices came down. Buying those companies could still be a potential good value over a longer period of time, and you can make money on the offset of this as they even rebound even further. Then also for disposable income would be to buy really the industry that have been hurt the most. So you can look at this on a sector basis. You have the hotel and hospitality industry that's gotten killed. You have airlines that have gotten killed right now. Are those airlines going to go under or go away? Who knows? It depends if they take a bailout or not. So, if they take the bailout, you know that they're going to be around at least until the fall, because that's when the money would technically run out. And at that point, if uh, all is back to normal, they're going to continue to grow and then they'll eventually their stock price will rebound also. So you could purchase them in as well. Same with like hotels, hospitality, stuff like that, and other, uh, other small business chains. And at the same time, right now, things that are propped up, it's going to be all of your online retail stuff, as well as like Walmart or Dollar General, things like that. So if you're looking for disposable income, I would say start there and then look at 
the sectors that are hit the most and you can either buy a basket like an ETF of those sectors, they, they exist, uh, or you could look at specific companies. Um, my personal that I do for a lot of clients right now has been completely hands off only because there's still a lot of things that are unknown, even on the airline side, Delta looks like a very attractive buy, but if they don't take the bailout and there's rumors that they may not, they could actually file for a chapter 11 bankruptcy. And that means they're going to liquidate the pension plan and that will absolutely crush their stock. And they're considering that because uh, if they take the bailout and let's say the virus stays around and uh, that money runs out in the fall and because of elections, they don't know who the new president will be, if it's still gonna be Trump or not, that means they don't know if they're gonna get another round of bailouts. And so Delta's thinking to themselves, you know what, if we turn away this bailout, we could actually liquidate the pension plan for all of our employees and we could file for chapter 11 and the government has to help us anyway. And if they do that, like I said, that can kill the stock price. So a few people have actually had called me that asked me that recently that were clients and said, let's buy Delta. I'm like, let's not, because <laughs> we don't know what's gonna happen yet because it might be an attractive buy, but guess what? It could be an even worse buy if they, if they don't accept the bailout and then file for bankruptcy. So I would say everything in this market is so fluid that whatever you're gonna do, just accept the risk. If, if it goes down further, know that going into it, that you could still lose money in this market, even more so than has already been lost. Cool, awesome. I'm gonna ask one more question. This is the one I wanna end on because I think it's perfect for you. How do you buy a car as a sort of investment? Let's say an antique car that uh, can appreciate in value. All right, uh, that part, I have no freaking clue and I will admit that. So buying a car as a true investment to make money, I don't know how because um, cars are very finicky as far as value is concerned. Now, the way that I looked at my cars as an investment was because it opened doors and allowed me to do things that I couldn't do in the past, which uh, was just getting certain people to take a meeting with me or meeting people at Cars and Coffee. Uh, like using the McLaren allowed me to go to local car shows and talk to people that even though it didn't make me any smarter, or any better at my job, people would be more open to talking to me, which is kind of sad. It speaks a little bit about society, but it is what it is. I played that knowing it and I played the perception of reality thing. So people perceive sometimes at least in that community, if you have a cool car, you must mean you do something, you're very successful. So I use that to my advantage and I look at that as being the investment because that car allowed me to meet many people that became then very good clients and allowed me to then meet more people through them that became a client and ultimately landed me meeting who is now uh, the CEO of the hedge fund that I'm working with as chief investment officer. I met him because I walked up to him at a car show simply to see if I can get him as a client. And then he turned around to me uh, after we became friends two, two years later and said, I want you to manage the hedge fund for me. So um, that's how I look at cars investment. On the other side, I, I don't buy whatever you like. If it's worth $10, who cares? Just do what you like. My car, if the McLaren is worth a penny by the time I'm done with it, because I'm going to drive it to 100,000 miles, I don't give a shit because I enjoy it. So do it for that and not for the investment side. Please, that's uh, my You're not a big believer in buying like a 57 Chevy that, that typically goes up in oh, value. Oh, no, I love old school cars, but you don't know. Like right now, for example, they might go up in value, but let's say after the baby boomers all die off, are we going to look at the 57 Chevy the same way that our father does? Just like... For me personally, I look at a 93 Supra. That's like my, that's my okay, element. I got, one more, I got one more to throw at you. Uh, an actual uh, certified whatever off the assembly line Shelby Cobra. Oh, a true AC Cobra? Oh my God. I mean, you're talking $2 million for a true, like a true authentic AC Cobra, a lot of money if it's in the original condition. <laughs> I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole because I bought one for, God, like one twelfth the price <laughs> as a replica. I'm fine you with that. <laughs> you, don't think, you don't think a two million a, a true AC Cobra is going to go up in value? Oh, it could absolutely go up in value. It might go up in value in perpetuity, but at the same time, you got to get the two million dollars to spend on the car first in today's dollars. So <laughs> the other thing, I mean, if that's a goal, you can work out how to do it. Uh, I just, for me, I don't care about the car side of it for that. There's a lot of other ways to make money uh, than just hoping. I just wanted to push you on it. I'm, I'm never going to buy cars for investments, but I wanted to push you on it and see what you'd say, because I know you love cars. Um, so that was more of having fun with you. Uh, <laughs> and his Cobra guys is beautiful. I don't know. You've got a picture of it, but I would almost rather have that than the uh, McLaren because it's such a head turner. And it, it is a lot of fun. It's crazy for the price difference, too. That, that actually gets more attention than the McLaren stuff, which is more attention. Funny. 
than any car, I think. I can't think of a car that can get more attention driving down the road than a, than a Shelby Cobra. Mm -hmm. So unique, look, so rare on the road. And you got the top down off because they don't really have tops. It's a few of them yeah, do. Yeah, have tops. <laughs> just don't be out in the rain. Really the top, but, uh, but yeah, and they just, and they, they rumble when they come down the road and they have the, oh uh, yeah, they just look amazing. So, um, and uh, Sky saying you haven't seen my Cuda. I, I don't, a Barracuda, I, guess, I don't know. The Cudas are amazing, but. I love Cudas. A 70 Cuda would be badass in the garage. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's your next car. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. I want to thank Jonathan for being here. He's awesome. It was great having him. Uh, we're going to do more with Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Again, Jonathan, uh, I love it because he's excited about you making money. He's not just like trying to do it for a job. He's literally excited about you making money. and gets excited to show you how you can change your life. And not just your money, your mindset. He wants to work with how you think about money. And that's what makes him uh, really good, uh, in my opinion, somebody that you could consider working. It's up to you. I'm not telling you what to do. You guys decide. But uh, Jonathan, do you want to, uh, what's your information again? Yeah, I, I'm trying to type this, whatever the thing hates me. Um, hold on here. Actually, Brian, do you mind putting up, um, typing in my email and just putting it in your chat? Because I don't know why Zoom Ready is not like me today. But I'll, I'll give out my uh, my personal email, which is J is in John, M is in Mike, T is in Tom, 5049 at gmail.com. 5049 at gmail. Yep, and then anyone can shoot me an email if you have questions, and uh, we could take it from there. Uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. What's the website and all that stuff again? Uh, www.startmakingit.com. They can get the book there too? Yep, yeah, that's, that's the website. It's exclusively dedicated for the book. Okay, there you go. And, um, and I just wrote his email in above, guys. Whoever wrote what's his email, I literally just wrote it in above the comment that you asked me that. So, uh, so double check it again. Um, and uh, and Jonathan just wrote it again. Oh, I wrote it on panelists, and Jonathan rewrote it to everybody. I see what happened. So you guys didn't see it. So perfect. <laughs> you guys have it. I, I was. And uh, so it's a pleasure having you, bud. Um, yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone for taking this time uh, during their days to actually listen to me blab on. I, I hope everyone at least uh, got something out of it and love to talk to you guys again. When we get to the uh, mindset with of money, where I'm going to be teaching about mindset of money, we're going to have Jonathan come in and teach a lot about investing at that one. We're going to have um, um, Josh come in and teach about accounting and handling your numbers in an easy way. We're going to really cover the whole basis of getting your money reality handled. So um so between the three of us and uh uh we should be able to really get something going and then we can bring in some people uh to talk about business you know specifically about getting some businesses started stuff too but um but that's going to be the future so if you guys want something like that let us know uh we can do that online maybe we even have a live version at some point we were talking about having a live version fun. yeah and we'll see what happens after all this i really would love to have a live version and what i'd like you to do is have a big live version with a ton of people and then for people that really want to work to, and personally with us, maybe we get a big house in some really nice place like up in Tahoe or something like that. And we sit down with like five, 10 people and we just have a discussion, you know, we can well, do. Well, I was going to say is actually for the money thing, what we could do is once it's done um, and the office is all, um, the construction is done, I'll have the entire back room be a garage for the cars and an office as well. So we could totally have everyone come down to Florida, um, hanging out for a couple of days over the weekend and, Focus it inside the uh, inside the office because uh, how many how many people um, could you get in there? Do you think we had a that? workshop? How many people do you think we could get in there? Oh, fifty. Fifty. So there you go. Maybe we do a. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could. It could it's live fit, financial. It's know. gonna fit ten cars in the back. Like the back area will be for literally all of the cars. So um, and then there's the conference rooms and everything in the front of it as well. So it's it will have enough room to fit a lot of people. We can make it work. That would be awesome. I think it'd be, it'd be fun to go to have everyone there too. It'd be like a fun like ribbon cutting ceremony. Also, at the first. So how many of you guys would be interested in going to, to something like where's it's in Hershey, Pennsylvania? No, no, no. Uh, Naples, Florida. Naples, Florida. Okay. How many of you would be interested in going to Naples, Florida for an event like that where we have we have uh, Josh, me, Jonathan, uh, maybe Dave will come and talk about you know different stuff, different stuff with consistency that he does. 
and we'll uh, we'll dive in. You get to hang out with the cars. You get to hang out. In, Naples is a really rich, a wealthy neighborhood too. Um, the weather sucks though. That's the only thing. The weather's yeah, terrible. Down in frogs there, man. Freaky. Like I walk down the street and I was like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> and then it was like, "Oh, those are frogs." And I'm like, yeah. "That's a frog? What? It, it sounds inhuman." So yeah. Um, and and it was so humid, I could cut it with a knife at night. But that was in. You know, I think I was there in summer. Yeah, the summertime it does get humid. It does. I I won't even deny that. It's, but it was beautiful. It was it beautiful. Was it was absolutely beautiful. I loved it. Um, Awesome guys, they love the idea. They're all putting in uh, thank you and all that and all that kind of stuff. So, awesome, thanks guys, appreciate it. So, um, with that said, I want to thank Jonathan one more time for being here. If you guys are on the Facebook page, thank you for having me. Make sure you're welcome. Make sure to comment on the Facebook page. If you get your question answered, put it on the Facebook page. We'll see if we can get talk to Jonathan into going there and answering some questions in the comments for you guys. Uh, if he's got some time. Sure. Um, and then uh and then like subscribe share if you think somebody you know somebody that can ha that needs this information share it with them especially in this time of need a lot of people are having trouble with money i'm looking over here because you guys are all over here but the camera's over here so i need to look here you guys uh these a lot of people are having trouble with money right now so this might be a great video to share with people if you're on youtube same thing share mm -hmm. comment we're always checking out the comments make sure to like subscribe hit that bell notification so you can get all the uh the videos and the more you share, the more you like, the more you subscribe, that type of stuff, the, the better it is for the algorithm, the more people it gets in front of, the more material we can put out, the more we can help you guys, it all compounds. So the more we wanna, wanna put material out. So you're helping, if you really believe in Fearless in the process and you, and you like it, then we're asking you to do that to help get the information out so we can keep bringing you this awesome information. Can you send me this link also? Cause I'll cross post this on my Facebook page also then if people want to watch it there. Cause I'm sure some people on my page would probably get some good value of this also and then could help get people in touch with you guys as well. Yeah, Jonathan, can you do that? Jonathan, Sebastian? Um, that would be no problem. Let's see. Uh, but once somebody will send it over. So um, you guys. Uh, and ladies, uh, have a beautiful day. And uh, remember, only the confident really live. Take care.